C'est un grand plaisir de, de vous présenter euh, Elena Sinova, qui euh, va nous parler de enfin, la réalisation, évidemment. Euh, Elena a fait sa, sa thèse avec euh, Gabriel Di Hanover et maintenant professeur à l'université de Neuchâtel. C'est de Neuchâtel. Non, mais ça J'ai des origines suisses, donc je peux me moquer un petit peu. Euh, en tout cas, euh, elle a beaucoup travaillé sur la grammaticalisation, euh, en particulier euh, d'un point de vue un peu euh, novateur, avec, euh, en, en, en prenant en compte des, des approches comme la constructionnalisation. Euh, et donc, voilà, je me suis dit que c'était intéressant pour nous d'avoir une, une, euh, dans cette conférence où. On, on essaye de regarder l'histoire de la grammaticalisation, d'avoir un, euh, un future outlook hein, d'une certaine manière hein, sur le, ce, qui, ce que ça pourrait donner euh, par la suite. Merci beaucoup. Je peux juste. Euh... Uh, can you hear me? So, or do I have to use the micro? Micro? Better? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to talk in English. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for inviting me for the, to this conference. And I would also like to thank you for organizing this conference, which raises very important questions for the research on grammaticalization. I still remember there used to be a series of conferences named New Reflections on Grammaticalizations. And the third one held in Santiago de Compostela was my first con international conference ever. But sadly, the fourth one held in Leuven, I think 2008 was the last one. Um, in my view, however, and given tons and tons of papers, of research papers and handbook articles, grammaticalization research and grammaticalization theory do constitute probably the most important in the most relevant branch of historical linguistics. Um, and my impression is that still many central theoretical questions remain unanswered, and there is still a lot to do for us. So thanks again, Benjamin and James, for giving us the opportunity today to exchange and to discuss these important issues during today and tomorrow. Today, I'm going to talk about some recent changes in grammaticalization in the conceptualization of the notion of grammaticalization. And as Benjamin said, I will focus especially on the interrelations between grammaticalization and constructionalization. Um, so here's my plan for today. I will first recall some points of discussion related to the concept of grammaticalization, which are all known to us, I think. Um, among them, the concept of grammatical constructionalization. And then I will present two case studies of mine, which I will use to demonstrate that the concept of grammaticalization cannot be equal with the concept of constructionalization. Um, with still growing interest in grammaticalization studies, it seems only logical that some initial assumptions have been questioned and the fact that some issues in grammaticalization theory have undergone broad debates shows that the concept has not remained the same, but has developed further. The reassessment of the notion of grammaticalization started, to my knowledge, with the volume The Limits of Grammaticalization from the year 1908. I quote from the cover of the book, is grammaticalization to be distinguished from lexicalization the creation and fixing of new words out of older patterns of compounding? If so, how is the line to be drawn between a form that is grammatical and one that is lexical? Should the term grammaticalization be extended to the study of the origins of grammatical constructions in general? Back in 98, yeah. What principle govern these processes? Is grammaticalization a unidirectional event or can change occur in the reverse direction? And then in 2001, the special issue of language science came out with articles such as those of Neumeier's Deconstructing Grammaticalization, or Brian Joseph's Is There Such a Thing as Grammaticalization? I think we are all familiar with the, with the critical voices saying that grammaticalization is not a unified process, but an epiphenomenon. Oh, sorry. 
<laughs> here and something like this. No. Mm. I think I'll, well, or maybe you just move back yes, there. Yeah. Sorry. Um, somehow, following up on this, uh, Muriel Lorde and Karen Behring uh, have developed the so called clustering approach to grammaticalization 2014, in which they distinguish between main changes or main mechanisms, such as reanalysis and, and reinterpretation, uh, between primitive changes. That is small changes occurring in different domains of linguistics, morphology, syntax, phonology, semantics, and discourse, and side effects, among them layering, paradigmatization, obligatorification, and changes in frequency. In a way, this approach is in line with the critique that grammaticalization is not a process on its own, but is a composite change, as the name it. Another big issue is the concept of unidirectionality. The discussion started in the, I think, in the 90s of the 20th century and culminated in the monograph Degrammaticalization by Muriel Nord in 2009. Without going into detail, I would like to quote Christian Lehmann. This is a quote from the internet. The current state of research is essentially the same. That is, the thesis on the inexistence of degrammaticalization is an empirical hypothesis which has not yet been thoroughly falsified. Should a completely convincing case be found, something that no current theory is in a position to exclude, then it would merit considerable interest. The theory of grammaticalization, however, would be only marginally affected. Empirical linguistic theorems are generally subject to a couple of exceptions. Language is an activity of human beings who fortunately sometimes oppose the general trend. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, and other researchers have argued in the same way, in particularly Martin Haspelmatt in several of his articles. Apart from the discussions uh, initiated by critical voices from outside the grammaticalization research, there have been some relevant shifts within the framework itself. Initially, and importantly, with the thoughts of grammaticalization by Christian Lehmann, grammaticalization has been thought of as loss. Hopper and Traugott observe from very early times researchers on issues related to grammaticalization have observed that it involves the process of loss of semantic content. This can be described by the metaphor of fading or bleaching. Gabelin spoke of verbleichen, mehr of affaiblissement. And then Hein and Tre, with the term grammaticalization, we refer essentially to an evolution whereby linguistic units lose in semantic complexity, pragmatic significance, syntactic freedom, and phonetic substance, respectively. However, <clears throat> in the following decades, this view changed, and many researchers emphasized the opposite, that is, the gain aspect of grammaticalization. Here are some quotes from Traugott, 2003. Some of the original, often relatively concrete semantic components of a lexeme may be general, generalized or even lost, but more abstract ones may be gained, as well as new pragmatic meanings. Or Heine, 2003, in the same way as linguistic items undergoing grammaticalization lose in semantic, morphosyntactic, and phonetic substance, they also gain in properties characteristic in the, of their uses in new contexts, sometimes to the extent that their meaning may show little resemblance to the original meaning. And Bybee, 2003, focusing on um, frequency changes, a grammaticalizing contraction's frequency of use increases dramatically as it develops. One source of the increased frequency is an increase in the types of context in which the new construction is possible. Related to this loss versus gain issue, a distinction between two different conceptualization of grammaticalization has been proposed that has been made by Traugott. And she named the two approaches grammaticalization as reduction versus grammaticalization as expansion. Uh, whereas traditionally grammaticalization has been conceived of as reduction involving such changes as formal reduction, freezing, obligatorification, reduced complexity, and semantic bleaching. 
More recently, grammaticalization is understood as expansion, in particular, as it is described by Himmelmann as context expansion, host class expansion, and semantical pragmatic expansion. It has been observed in numerous studies dealing with grammaticalization, but most discussions around the notion of grammaticalization arise from the absence of a unified definition of grammar. As our understanding of grammar is often not made explicit and grammar is not defined explicitly in a unified manner, the concept of grammaticalization suffers from problems. I don't want to review the available definitions and just want to emphasize that the definition of grammaticalization relies heavily of, on, on the concept of grammar that we adopt. And according to the view of grammar, the concept of grammaticalization may differ considerably from one approach to another. I listed here some of the uh, recent attempts to define grammar in terms of, for example, obligatoriness in, this, in the tradition of Jakobson, or paradigmaticity, the definition of Lemon deal and myself, the secondary sta status. Um, this is the approach by Boyer and Tarda, or in terms of procedure, procedural meanings conveyed by grammatical forms, which is the approach taken in Trapot. And I think we will hear more to this question tomorrow in the talk of Martin Polichka on the definitions of grammar. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> and I would like to close this introductory part uh, on problems and challenges with a positive remark. Though the definitions of grammar and grammaticalization are still lacking, the research on grammaticalization has achieved a lot in terms of empirical investigations and generalizations, as well as in terms of theoretical modeling. And I think we all agree on the following points that grammar can only be defined relative to lexicon, that there is a continuum between lexicon and grammar, and that grammaticality, grammaticality as well as lexicality are credible. As more and more empirical investigations from different languages of the world have been conducted, it became clear that grammaticalization is a rather broad concept, and the changes can be more or less representative of this concept. So that we have to do with the prototypical concept. Good and prototypical cases of grammaticalization are instances, instances of morphologization. That is the development of grammatical affixes from lexical words. As to the stage, uh, stage of critics, I'm looking forward to the talk of Martin Haspelmatt tomorrow. But for the, for the nominal domain, the climb from noun or relational noun to case affix is more or less representative of this change. And for the verbal domain, decline from the full verb to affix. That is, the middle part of the given scale syntax to morphology can be said to constitute the prototypical, the good instance of grammaticalization. But even in this rather prototypical region of the notion, a distinction between primary and secondary grammaticalization was introduced as early as by Kurilovich himself. Among the definitions, we find the evolution of an already grammaticalized item to, uh, towards an even greater degree of grammaticalization, or lexical items and constructions once, gram gr once grammaticalized continue to, to develop new grammatical functions, or shifts from free morpheme to enclitic marker and from enclitic to inflectional marker. I will not go into further detail on this issue and just want to refer to Tina Brebant's conclusions in her 2014 paper. Overall, the changes identified in the definitions above can all be captured within a general definition of grammaticalization, and neither of them justifies the addition of secondary grammaticalization as a separate notion. Another concept that has been introduced and hotly debated, I think some 10 years ago, concerns the development of pragmatic markers, discourse markers, and modal particles, pragmaticalization. Without going into much detail on this issue either, there was a kind of consensus in the literature that essentially the development of discourse markers pertains to the realm of grammaticalization. Here's the quote uh, from Trauger, 2007. If we construe grammaticalization as the development of grammatical material, that is, the material that signals speaker's perspective on the relationship among participants in an event, 
of events to each other and to the time of the speech situation and of utterances to each other and the beliefs of speakers and hearers, we can see that discourse markers like these traditional grammatical markers typically undergo changes associated with grammaticalization. More recently, however, um, Heine and Kalkenberg and the colleagues developed a distinction between so-called sentence grammar and thetical grammar and proposed a new notion for the diachronic development of discourse markers, the term cooptation. Uh, cooptation, uh, I quote, is an operation whereby a chunk of sentence grammar, such as a word, a phrase, a reduced clause, a full clause, or even a larger discourse segment, is deployed for use on the level of discourse processing, thereby turning into a pedicle. Thus, cooptation appears to be responsible for a number of the functional changes that were attributed in some works to effects of grammaticalization. Another term. What is my focus today is the change in perspective from item-based view on grammaticalization to construction-based view on grammaticalization. In the traditional view, grammaticalization was thought of as a development of individual grammatical signs, as described in this quote. From the <laughs> Um, major diagnostics for grammaticalization are the change of meaning occurring in the grammatical sizing element and changes in its morphological and phonological characteristics. Again, these diagnostics focus on the grammatical sizing element. In short, we may call it the element based view on grammaticalization. In the, in the first decade of the century, however, the focus shifted from individual elements to constructions. So uh, Himmelmann proposes an approach to grammaticalization that is based on syntagmatic configurations of a, new gramma, uh, of a new grammatical item. And he says, instead, it is the grammaticizing element in its syntagmatic context, which is grammaticized. That is the unit to which grammaticalization properly applies are constructions and not isolated lexical items. And in a similar way, in by 2003 speaks of grammaticalization of new construction and the creation of new construction. However, until the introduction of the proper term constructionalization, uh, to which I will come in a second, the term construction was understood as a syntagmatic context, as the environment in which the grammaticalizing item gets grammaticalized. It was first in the monograph with the title Constructionalization and Constructional Changes that Trogut uh, and Trousdale introduced a construction based view on diachronic change, including grammaticalization. They defined constructionalization as the creation of form new meaning new combination of signs. It forms new type nodes, which have new syntax in or morphology and new coded meaning in the linguistic network of a population of people. It is accompanied by changes in degree of schematicity, productivity, and compositionality. Minimally, constructionalization involves new analysis of morphosyntactic form and semantic pragmatic meaning, which roughly corresponds to reanalysis in traditional terms and semantic reinterpretation. <clears throat> in their book, they try to reintroduce then grammaticalization and lexicalization in terms of constructionalization. So they uh, differentiate between grammatical or procedural constructionalization, which involves increase in schematicity and productivity of constructions and decrease in compositionality. Um, and on the other hand, uh, they define lexical or contentful constructionalization as a process uh, involving decrease in schematicity, productivity and compositionality of a construction. And in a later paper, Trouss, still in order, say that grammaticalization is a subset of grammatical constructionalization and lexicalization is a subset of lexical constructionalization. But in general, we can see that the term grammaticalization is equaled with the term grammatical constructionalization in this framework and the term lexical, lexicalization with the term lexical constructionalization. Um, I'm 
just showing you this table to remind you of the original distinction between lexicalization and um, grammaticalization introduced in the book by Brinton and Trauger 2005. As you can see, both processes are seen to have much in common, and the points of divergence are considered to be the functional shift, the decategorialization, changes in time frequency, in productivity, changes in talking frequency, and change in the, in the typologi typological generality of the process. In what follows, I will present you two case studies and concentrate on the notions of grammaticalization, lexicalization, and constructionalization. And we'll ask, we'll ask the following question, what do we gain or what do we lose by adopting the constructional perspective that is the concept of grammatical constructionalization and lexical constructionalization? My first case study is on verbal, uh, on German verbal nominal constructions. In German linguistics, the notion Funktionsverbgefüge, which corresponds to English light verb construction or composite predicate, refers, refers to all kinds of more or less irregular combinations of a Funktionsverb and an abstract de-verbal noun, often preceded by a preposition, such as, for example, in in Ordnung bringen, zur Aufführung bringen, kommen, oder ins Rollen bringen, kommen. In this combination, the verb is semantically bleached, and the semantic core of the predicate is shifted to the noun. And these combinations usually display a number of restrictions with respect to their syntactic behavior. In the literature, lexicalization as well as grammaticalization were argued to be at work in the diachronic development of these constructions. Since Brinton 2011, the idea of a rather heterogeneous group of constructions with different degrees of grammaticalization or lexicalization has become more popular. She proposes to differentiate between the lexicalized, the so-called loose side of type constructions, on the one hand, which are non-productive, fossilized, and lexicalized, um, and the grammaticalized, so-called take a look at type constructions, which are productive, schematic, which are compositional and have a grammatical function. In, um, in a corpus study based on some uh, 27,000 observations from a DTA, the Deutsche Textarchiv Corpus of German, uh, Vanessa Stöber and I analyzed the behavior and the status of combinations of the verb common and the prepositional phrases with the preposition zu. Uh, for example, zum Vorschein common, zu Hilfe common, zu Aufführung common. The results of this study show that indeed, following the proposal of Brinton, we can clearly distinguish between two different groups of constructions and even more that there is a continuum between these types of construction. We call the first group to stand the common type after one of the nouns used in the construction. If you look at the result of the constructional analysis displayed here, which shows the degree of attraction between the construction and the noun in, in, in this construction. You can see that nouns occurring in this construction type are particularly associated with this construction, and they are also particularly frequent in this construction. Um, in this diagram, you see the frequency curves for the four nouns in the analyzed periods. Hilfe, Vorschein, Stand, and Sprache. In general, we can observe an increase of token frequency for these four constructions, but that Hilfe seems to become less frequent, but we have to consider that the construction with Hil Hilfe was already very frequent at the starting point of, of the analysis. What we also observe in the data is a decreasing variability. You see four diagrams here. This a decreasing syntactic variability within the construction. And what we show here is the, um, the intervening material between the preposition and the noun in the construction, if that is possible or not possible. We see that uh, it, to, to the end of the analyzing period, the variability decreases so that each of the construction is fixed to one particular form, but this is not the, not the same form for each construction. It is zu Vorschein, it is zu Stande, but it is zu Hilfe. With respect to semantics, we have to <clears throat> say that each construction displays its own idiosyncratic meaning. The compositionality and semantic transparency is reduced. 
And um, in Sprache, for example, is outside of the construction a totally different meaning. And stand, stand as well. And for constructions with Vorschein, there doesn't even exist a corresponding noun outside of the construction. To sum up so far, uh, the so standard common type displays a high token frequency for each construction. They have fixed forms, but each individual construction is fixed to another form, as you can see here. They are non-compositional and they are idiomatic. So on the other hand, we have the so unbundled common type, another com of construction. And it, as you can see here from the association strength table, the nouns participating in the construction are still significantly, significantly attracted to the pattern, but they are located rather in the middle of their ranking, which shows that the construction is productive. If we look at frequency changes, we see a clear increase of the token frequency, but also the increase of type frequency in the construction and the stable number of new types in the construction with the blue line in the, in the, in the second diagram. That is, we may conclude that since more and more noun types occur in the noun slot of the construction, the construction gradually gains in schematicity. If we look at formal changes within the construction and look at the, at the slot between the preposition and the noun, we clearly see the decrease in syntactic variability in the development of the dominant pattern to the noun and then come. Um, as concerns the semantics, this type of construction is associated with rather general passive semantics. Um, in, in the passive semantics is um, maintained in mo most cases of this construction. And this, uh, this confirms these descriptions often found in the literature on German Funktionswerbgefüge. This zur Darstellung kommen can be translated as is shown and zur Befruchtung kommen to be fertilized. Now, uh, to sum up for the for the for the type to unbend to come, we can see the establishment of a general pattern with a high type frequency of the noun slot. The pattern is fixed, and the pattern has a general passive semantics. So we are now in the position to decide whether we see a case of grammatical or lexical constructionalization uh, if we compare these two uh, construction types. For the two-standard uh, common type, it can be said that we are dealing with lexical constructionalization and lexicalization. And on the other hand, to unwind the common type can be characterized as a case of grammatical constructionalization or grammaticalization. <clears throat> However, I add here a question mark to this classification, and we'll come to this point later after I have um, presented you my second case study. Okay, so my second study is also on complex constructions, and these complex constructions are complex prepositions in German. Uh, it's it's not a cross linguistic study; it's a study on German complex prepositions, and this will become very important in the next um, uh, uh, later. Um, we, the study deals with German prepositions formed after the general pattern, preposition, mm -hmm. noun, and then preposition or a noun phrase in the genitive case, uh, such as, for example, in Bezug auf, im Zusammenhang mit, mit Hilfe von, or genitive, or im Vergleich. Interestingly, and in parallel to verbal nominal construction, which I described, the question has often been raised whether the development of complex prepositions constitutes a case of lexicalization or a case of grammaticalization. So the case is very similar. Um, the, uh, very generally, the discussion may be roughly summarized as follows. The addition of a new expression to the lexicon of the language is usually considered to be a case of lexicalization. As the development of complex prepositions involves the creation of a new linguistic string, 
which has not been there before. There are reasons to call the emergence lexicalization. On the other hand, the newly emerged expression behaves similarly to primary or simple prepositions in this language and constitutes an intermediate stage on this grammaticalization climb from a positional recursion to the case marker at the end of the climb. On these grounds, the emergence of complex prepositions had been considered a case of grammaticalization. As a part of an ongoing project on complex prepositions, we conducted a corpus study based on the data of some uh, uh, thousand observations from the same corpus. And we looked at particular stru structures with a general pattern with the preposition mit, and then the deverbal noun uh, followed by a preposition or by nominal phrase in genesis. As for example, mit hilfe, mit rücksicht, mit bezug, mit berücksichtigung. Similar to the study of verbal nominal constructions, we also could clearly distinguish between two groups and a large amount of constructions which are in between these two groups. On the one hand, there is Mithilfe, um, which considerably increases in frequency over time. And we have here the token frequency of this construction. For the form, we can see that the that the form becomes fixed in the, in the course of time with respect to the use of determiners and modificators between the preposition and the noun. And with respect to the postpositional complement, the font prepositional phrase is introduced in the course of time and is added as an alternative form of the genitive in German, which follows the general trend that the font phrase replaces the um, the genitive in most contexts. To sum up, we can say for uh, from the sem uh, sem from, from the semantic point of view, Mithilfe started in context with animate reference, and very prominently with context like in seven Gottes Hilfe. But it gradually spread it also to abstract reference as fremde Nationen in eight. And now we also find Mithilfe with inanimate reference, as for example in nine, Mithilfe einer Feuerleiter. So we can see that Mithilfe have acquired um, more and more general instrumental semantics as in nine. And I can again summarize that this type, Mithilfe type construction, is characterized. By high token frequency, fixed form, sometimes even univerbation in the um, in the spelling of mit and hilfe, and reduced compositionality and the um, the new idiomatic meaning. Similarly, the uh, the strings in Folge, Aufgrund, and Anstelle have the same. We can observe the same changes for these strings. Remarkably and very interestingly, we found this one in our data set related structures with nearly synonyms to Hilfe, um, which also have a very similar contextual semantics if you look into, into the data. These are, for example, Zuziehung, Unterstützung, Beistand, Beihilfe, Rat, and how animals. However, we also see that none of these combinations reached the same conventionalization status as Mithilfe. These structure, structures have relatively low token frequency. Most of them are used with determiners or modifiers between the uh, preposition and the noun, and they are restricted to context with animate reference, the first stage of Mithilfe. That is, we can say that they are not involved in a development process similar to Mithilfe type construction. And here again, on the other hand, we have another construction type. Uh, we uh, call them mit Bezug auf type after one of the nouns occurring in this construction. And you can see that this structure, this thematic and productive uh, pattern, uh, shows even more pronounced increase in token frequency, especially in the course of the 19th century, where we observe a very steep increase. And on the type level, we also observe an increase in type frequency and a stable amount of new types entering the, the construction in the course of time. 
Um, here again, the formal changes within the construction uh, show that there is an increase in, in syntactic variability and the, that the construction um, gets fixed to the form mid and followed by the noun without any intervening material between the preposition and the noun within the construction. And with respect to the, uh, to the postpositional complement, we see that the preposition of is still the dominant, the dominant complement form, but also the, um, the genitive and the phone phrase enter the construction as new items, as new nouns enter the construction, which have other morphosyntactic characteristics and carbon, for example, a genitive. So semantically, the constructions such as mit Rücksicht auf, in consideration of, mit Bezug auf, with regard to, mit Beziehung auf, with reference to, they all share semantics, very general semantics, very abstract semantics, very abstract semantic of reference. Here, I can sum up that this type, mit Bezug auf type of construction of complex prepositions, follows the general and relatively fixed schema, mit noun and then the preposition. It shows increase in type frequency of the noun slot. There is um, a number of nouns which enter the construction um, and the pattern has abstract semantics of reference. So here again, if we want to categorize the diachronic development of these two types just described, we come to the conclusion that Mithilfe type constitutes a case of lexicalization or lexical constructionalization because we get a fixed individual type construction which is not productive and which is idiomatic. And on the other hand, with mit Bezug auf type, we should consider is, uh, it as a grammatical constructionalization because what we, what, we, what we have in the end is a schematic, a productive construction, the general schema, uh, semantics, uh, which can be productively extended to other nouns. But you can see that again, I put a question mark there, and now I come to the uh, to the discussion of these cases of these categorizations. So this is not the end of the story, and I first return to the verbal nominal constructions again to the Funktionsverbgefüge, namely to the zu Anwendung common tab, which we, which I characterized as a case of grammatical constructionalization. And now to answer the question whether it is a case of grammaticalization or not, we need other criteria. Yeah? And this is what I'm going to argue for in the next, next couple of minutes. Um, and we have to broaden the focus and look outside of the construction, what is happening in the, in the language. In broadening the focus and looking at related constructions, we can see that this construction type is or enters close relation to other construction types as, for example, construction of the same type, but with another verb, the verb bringen, zu Anwendung kommen, bringen, zu Verwendung kommen, bringen, zu Wirkung kommen, bringen. And in the next, in turn, these two construction types may be contrasted or related to the base noun of the, the verbal, of the base verb of the, the verbal noun from which the noun is derived as anwenden, verwenden, wirken, and fühlen. In fact, what I'm going to, to, to propose is that we can see that zu Anwendung common construction type is participating in paradigmatic relations to the bringen construction and to the base verb. Whereas the common construction displays passive semantics and thus reduces the valency of the base verb to one uh, argument, the bringing construction increases or restores the valency frame of the verb and conveys positive semantics. I would like to argue that the common construction can be seen as entering paradigmatic relations and thus participating in paradigmatic integration, a fourth stage in a grammaticalization scenario proposed by Gabriele Dio to myself back in 2012. Importantly, I don't want to say that the construction is highly grammaticalized at this stage. Yeah? 
But what I am saying that the development of this construction can indeed be seen as a case of grammaticalization because there is a grammatical domain, there is a grammatical category into which it has the potential to be integrated. The target category I have in mind is the category of voice, which can be realized by means of different constructions in German. Uh, here are some, some examples from these different from this, the array of constructions. You have the canonical form with the with auxiliary and full verb, such as werden, sein, kriegen, bekommen, passive. But we also have other forms which are more restrictive with respect to morphosyntactic, with respect to uh, semantic um, characteristics, such as causative, last and plus infinitive, uh, uh, such as uh, reflexive constructions with middle and reflexive semantics and so on. But also the morphosyntactic, the morphological construction, the applicative construction with the prefix B. B -A. Um, what I suggest is that the schematic and productive verbal nominal constructions with common and bringen are on the way to be paradigmatically integrated into the category voice. And therefore, the diachronic development can be considered as a case of grammaticalization. In contrast, if we look at complex propositions from the perspective of paradigmaticity, a totally different picture emerges. And we cannot maintain the categorization displayed here that Mithilfe type is lexicalized and that Mitbezug type is grammaticalized. If we look at the target category of prepositions in German, there is a diachronically motivated distinction between younger secondary prepositions or complex prepositions and the older primary prepositions or simple prepositions. And one of the relevant criteria of this category is case assignment. Younger prepositions canonically assign genitive, whereas primary prepositions prefer accusative and dative, and this changes over time. And from our case study, it appears that it is the Mithilfe type, the lexicalized type, which is being integrated into the paradigm or into the category of prepositions in German. So you can, um, to illustrate this point, we have the category of simple prepositions on the right side as a target grammatical category, which is a relatively closed paradigm. On the left side, we have a large number of different constructions. Among them, this schematic and productive construction is, for example, mit Bezug auf, which we have analyzed in our copy study. And they have the potential to develop further towards the core of the category, but only some of them, such as Mithilfe or Infolge, Aufgrund, have left this, this highly populated region and um, and are on, the way, are on the way of paradigmatic integration into the target category. Here, however, due to the fact that we are dealing with a grammatical paradigm with loose paradigmatic relations, no tight paradigmatic oppositions are established between the, the individual members of this paradigm. Now, I would like to use a quote from uh, Christian Lehmann, 2000, uh, 2002, where he described the development of complex propositions in Germany in a very similar fashion. He said, we have seen that prepositions come about not by grammaticalization, but by lexicalization, he said. Once they have come into existence, they may then be grammaticalized. And from among all the new prepositions, only fraction is grammaticalized. All the others are abandoned and replaced by other new organisms. In this quote, I would suggest to replace the word lexicalization by constructionalization, as we witness the establishment of a pattern, as I have exemplified with my with Bezug of construction. That is, my proposal is that we can establish the client in which first a productive schema is established in, construction, in the process of constructionalization, and then some of the instances of this schema may be grammaticalized towards the target category of simple prepositions. Now, 
we have seen that in case of verbal nominal constructions, it is the schematic construction, which is which gets grammaticalized. In, in the case of complex prepositions, we have seen the opposite, that it is the lexic, the, the individual construction types which get uh, grammaticalized. So what do we learn from that? First, and I come to my conclusions, I think, I hope I go to time. First, I would like to emphasize that constructionalization and grammaticalization are not the same. Even if sometimes they look like the same and even that sometimes they overlap and even coincide, but notionally they are not, not, not the same processes. And we have seen that both individual items as well as complex constructions, individual like items like Mithilfe, and complex constructions such as to unbend a common type of function may be involved in grammaticalization. And the criterion I use to classify the individual cases of constructionalization as grammaticalization or not is in the in and paradigmaticity, a criterion which have been used in grammaticalization studies all along. Back to paradigmaticity. Paradigmaticity was defined by Christian Lehmann as follows. The cohesion of a sign with other signs in a paradigm will be called its paradigmaticity. That is the degree to which it enters the paradigm is integrated into it independent of it. That is what counts is the integration of a new construction or of a new item, of a new schematic construction, and productive construction, or even of a new specific construction, lexically specified construction, into an existing grammatical paradigm or a category. What is, however, important to consider at this point is that the paradigm or the category is something that is not universally given. But paradigms and categories exist in individual languages and may be structured in very, very different ways even in one particular language. What I have in mind saying that paradigms are not cross linguistically valid notions is in line with the observation on observation of Tina Reban, for example, on diversity of grammaticalization, she remarked, in the English noun phrase, different functions are syntactically arranged on the basis of word order rather, by means of rather than by means of afflictions. Hence, it seems only natural that changes in function involve broad order changes rather than increased boundedness. Tense and aspect in Hebrew, by contrast, are structurally realized as verbal morphology. It seems to have some leverage to think that individual realizations of morphosyntactic change and grammaticalization are dependent on the morphosyntactic structure and, for instance, differ in inflectionally or analytically organized structural environments. Taking up this idea, I would like to conclude my presentation with two general points on paradigms or on paradigmaticity. First, paradigms are domain-specific. They are domain-specific with respect to their semantic and their function, and they will differ from verbal to nominal categories, from verbal to nominal paradigms. But they are also different with respect to their form and their structure. It is, for example, verbal analytical construction are organized differently compared to, for example, prepositions or complementizers. Whereas verbal analytical construction or inflectional categories are organized in tightly organized paradigms with oppositions in the, in the Jacobson sense, we do not get it when we look at prepositions and complementizers, which are rather organized as broad classes or as a category with loose paradigmatic relations with it. That is, depending on the domain into which an item or a construction grammaticalizes and get integrated, grammaticalization processes will differ across domains. And on the other hand, and the second one point is that category and paradigms are language specific. They are not only domain specific, they are also language specific. They are specific to their semantic and that their function languages may differ with respect to the set 
of grammatical functions or grammatical paradigms that tend to have or that they tend to grammaticalize. We have seen these, for example, in our own research on the example of the category of evidentiality. Evidentiality is a highly grammaticalized category in some languages, but not at all, not in all languages. So languages will differ from each other with respect to which categories are available and which categories tend to grammaticalize. And they also uh, um, differ from each other with respect to form, to the morphosyntactic form and to the structure of the category, so that the languages differ with respect to the inventory of grammatical forms, grammatical construction they have. So therefore, grammaticalization processes will differ from each other across languages, from one language to other languages. And I hope tomorrow, Walter, Design will talk about something similar to that. <laughs> um, that is, in the end, in a unity, in a unified definition of the criterion of paradigmaticity, because paradigmaticity is a notion which is defined independently of a language specific or domain specific realization of a paradigm. There is a hidden diversity of the realization of, the, of this paradigmaticity across individual grammatical domain and across languages. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Nina. It's so cool. <clears throat> um, I'm getting that question yes in French or English. Yep. So if I have further questions, but it's well, if nobody else cares, then thank you very much for a very nice presentation, nice data. I was wondering if your focus is on paradigmaticity, and then of course you get these differences as you describe them. My question in this context would be to what extent is paradigmaticity enough? If I take, for instance, Immelmann's idea of expansion, then these common constructions, for instance, they are still not productive in the sense that you can combine them with many different uh, verbs or whatever it is. So it's not really the kind of passive. It could, could be interesting to look at how far common verbs develop in other languages. For instance, in Italian, venire is a bit further developed, I think, in its direction towards passivization, even though there are, of course, more productive, more expanded constructions. So I'm not quite sure to what extent, and that's what I'm going to talk tomorrow a bit more uh, about how one single criterion like paradigmaticity is enough, wouldn't there maybe other, other criteria as well and would have to integrate for evaluating this question of where we are between lexicalization and grammaticalization on the other hand. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the question. It is indeed a, a very difficult question if one criterion is enough, and I don't think so. I don't think that one criterion is enough because even in, in these carpet studies, we used other criteria, criteria first to differentiate the diachronic development of the two types of construction, which are uh, located, which we located on a cline between lexicalized and grammaticalized. So paradigmaticity was a, was a kind of rescue criterion to decide in the end after we have established the criteria of, of frequency and context expansion and productivity and schematicity in the construction terms. This was just to just to just to add a, but on the other hand, of course, I argue that paradigmaticity is one wow. central. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> no question there. It's yeah. about what factors need to be integrated to act to finally, well, create a mark like a passive marker for a language. And would you, and of course, we cannot predict how language is developed. But, uh, the prediction could be that common may 
turn into a more productive asset. I, for, for, for German, I don't think that common will be very successful in establishing itself as a, as a, as a patent marker because it's it's it is not a canonical verbal analytic construction, but but it is a construction with a with a with a verbal with a deverbal noun. And to to form a deverbal noun from a base verb is it's not possible for every verb that is available in them. So so it's so, but what I wanted to show is just the the possibility or the potential and the uh, the if if a category exists in a language and that the category is broad enough to to include different forms now, then i could say that the construction is grammaticalizing or that has been grammaticalized into this direction yeah. Yeah, thank you uh, for your talk. My question is a historical one, since this is also a conference on history. <laughs> um, you mentioned constructionalization uh, as a term, and you had some quotations, I think from Himmelman 2004, and maybe a bit earlier, emphasizing the importance of constructions uh, in grammaticalization. So Himmelman said, he contrasted the element view versus the constructional view, and maybe there's a few uh, mentions of the importance of constructions earlier, but that was only in the OLs, right? 2002, 2001 or so. I don't remember it from the 90s. I was around then, and somehow people didn't talk about the importance uh, of, or at least that's how I remember, you know, maybe. Um, Benjamin would uh, find something in the 1920s <laughs> of constructionalization or so. But um, I, my historical question is, what what happened? Was it just that construction grammar became more and more popular? Because because when I first read John by the sort of you know hammering or also trial work hammering the importance of construction, I said, sure. So what? We kind of always knew this. So. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. But I think there is a difference between the the first mention of construction of the importance of construction, uh, for example, in Himmelmann, because Himmelmann he still sees construction as a context because she, he focuses on the grammaticalizing item. If we look at the uh, there are these uh, notations of Himmelmann where there is one item. In the construction, in the in the contextual environment, that changes, and then it it is called con context expansion. And context expansion is written in the in the notation of the construction. So for Himmelmann, it's still the environment, the syntactic string around the grammaticalizing item. And I think indeed it is only with the the construction grammar, with the development of construction grammar, that we came to the idea that this is this is not the context, this is the construction which can become grammaticalized, which is in itself uh, a sign, a, a unit, uh, which can become grammaticalized and lexicalized. But on the other hand, we all have the, we all know these, the, um, um, the examples of uh, idioms, and I think from the research on idioms and on diachronic development of idioms, this is not related now to the grammaticalization research, but we have admitted that there, there are researchers who worked on the diachronic development of idioms and presimes and praseologisms. And I think there, perhaps there, we can find any mentions on constructionalization. Thank you for uh, an excellent synopsis of the development of scholarship and grammaticalization. Um, I'm kind of puzzled by the kinds of things we chose not to discuss. Um, <laughs> one thing you 
cited the word co-optation. Is it different from co-option? And the reason why I'm asking this is that when you put it in terms of the more common term co-option, I have a hand, but I can also co-opt it as a weapon. And when I co-opt it as a weapon, I can use it to slap, in which case I have to get the special position or punch, and I have to quench it. But when you think about it, everything is constrained by what I can do with my hand. And that's very significant also in the terms of grammaticalization. So I was wondering whether co-optation has a specific meaning that is not already covered by co-option. <laughs> and second, you talked a lot about semantics, loss of semantic means, the semantic function or whatever. I cannot speak of semantic meaning. <laughs> uh, so this semantic is the semantic uh, Why do I get the impression that semantics is reduced to denotation? Because there is such a thing as grammatical meaning. And what happens in grammaticalization is not really loss of meaning, but shift of meaning. That's how I understand it. And uh, there's a sense in which I think, especially Bernd Heiner has um, extrapolated grammaticalization to the emergence of karma. Does it make sense? Can we really talk of grammar or reduce grammar to the kinds of things that students of grammaticalization discuss, uh, things like that? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, I'll start with the first question. Uh, I have not talked a lot about co-optation because I'm personally, I'm not working on discus marker, so I have not empirical evidence to, to argue, to propose which, uh, which of, the, uh, of the terms is better suited to describe this, this, um, these developments. To my knowledge, cooptation is is related to the uh, to the term acceptation, also um, uh, from the for, from the evolution of the biology, uh, which have been used to to describe cases where. No, grammar, no, no straightforward uh, grammaticalization or lexicalization or analogy were at work. But apart from that, I cannot say why not, why not another term such as uh, co-option is not used in this context. As for your second question uh, to the loss of meaning, um, it's not a simple question, but if you look at um, in in individual cases, as for example, in the case of of the verb common in the construction I described in my in my case study, you can observe if we compare the verb common in the construction with the lexical verb, the motion verb common outside of the construction in its traditional in its in its prototypical canonical lexical use, we can see that the semantic content had, has been reduced because the, uh, because the meaning of the, of the motion in space is no, is no longer available in the constructions at hand. So in the, in the construction, so unwind the common, common is not a motion verb. Common is probably a verb which conveys grammatical meaning of specific, or even of inclusivity and a spectral uh, meaning, but it, it's not a motion verb. So in these cases, if we look at individual items and if we look at, and if we compare the grammaticalized verbs, full verbs and auxiliary verbs, we always will find that there is a loss of semantic content. On the other hand, you are right, that there is also a gain or a shift because other 
semantic and other grammatic, grammatical functions are acquired in the, in the course of grammaticalization. But there is, in the end, there is a loss yeah, of semantic content. Uh, as for your third question, if I understood you correctly, you ask whether one can equal the term grammaticalization with the term emergence of grammar. No, definitely not. Grammaticalization is not the emergence of grammar. And I think it has been clear all the way in the grammaticalization literature that there are other ways to create grammar. Yeah, there is analogy, there's reanalysis. There, are, yeah, but grammaticalization is something different. Grammaticalization is the creation of grammar out of lexical material. This is important. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you. I was um, wondering about your, your definition of paradigms. I don't know um, the way I find it is typical because I've never thought of this. But um, I wouldn't say that paradigms have to be domain specific in the sense that when you have a morphosyntactic thought with different, with a limited number of members here in the same way in terms of morphosyntax. We've already talked about paradigms. I was thinking of a couple of examples. <clears throat> Sorry, in um, many evidential languages that I'm thinking of, uh, you have uh, a paradigm of verbal suffixes, but only one of them, um, evidentiality, is, is, is uh, relevant. The other ones are neutral to the evidentiality, but they would express other domains such as person or, or, or tense or aspect. So uh, I don't know about the history of the definition of paradigms. I don't know if you if you look at it, or if everyone defines it as something domain specific. Thank you. Um, uh, I think I will, I will give you an, a, a historical answer. Uh, the, the traditional and the original, historically original definition of the paradigm is, of course, the inflectional paradigm with cells. In this paradigm, okay, you have to fill the cells, and if there is no nothing in the cell, then this is a problem for morphological theory. Uh, so, if we start from the inflectional paradigm and then look into the research on grammaticalization, we will see that in um, that it, it occurs very frequently that, and for example, analytical verbal periphrastic construction with auxiliaries often enter a paradigm together with the inflectional paradigm so that, for example, present tense and past tense is coded in terms of an inflectional paradigm, but there is also an analytical construction which is used, for example, for future tense. And I think at this point, and thanks to research on grammaticalization, we have started to think of paradigms, not in terms of inflectional paradigms in morphology, but in terms of categories, grammatical categories, which are organized around, around a marking of a grammatical meaning, but in a way that it is structured. And then you can add also word classes as a paradigms in this sense, so that um, uh, the uh, so that the uh, the notion of paradigmaticity gets broader and broader, but still, I think that to define grammaticalization by the criterion of paradigmaticity still requires a limit of paradigm, so that not all in the language can be put into a paradigm. Yeah, yeah. So that the, the, it is the, the structure in the paradigm, so that the member of the paradigm, the individual member of the paradigm, stay in opposition to each other. But I would say, to be very clear, maybe we should talk about morphosyntactic paradigm or semantic paradigm, because they are very different things, actually. Probably. But if we, yeah. Thank you. 